hello you've reached Lisa talking again so we're in the second part of our our series looking at how things got so bad to the point where austerity had generated a death toll of about 100,000 we have literally balkanized ourselves and catapulted out of the European Union and our political media culture who are caught in circles on Twitter are generating dysfunction while we are a stable country and kind of offsetting this quite well but I had been asked how we got here so what I discussed in the last video was the way that the context changes around economics. New systems evolve, political change happens, society changes, and periodically we need a belief system at the core of our economics which recognises these changes so that we don't generate massive instability. Now, in 2010, it was already very clear kind of that there was crisis caused by a reflex response that had been generated by the economics that we'd been using that had individualism at its core that believed that deregulation and kind of creation of kind of quasi markets in public systems, a very poor model of privatization had been lashing out at the same systems over about 30 years as a reflex response to crisis caused by spending by other pressures. We talked about the roots of this. We talked about Margaret Thatcher and a man called Milton Friedman. And we talked about how a man called Friedrich Heyer could warn that if you have centrally planned systems that are responding by reflex around a centrally controlled money supply, that you will end up with what we've just witnessed in the UK in the last 10 years. And we discussed the importance of looking at your media in class. In every revolution in history, the end of the Chinese imperial system, the Russian revolution, the regime in Iran, what's happened is that genuine political instability caused by a failure to adjust to change by a previous kind of regime has led to power being taken by small groups of often very, very violent kind of men with very dubious ideologies at their core. And in fact, that was what was demonstrated in Britain in the last 10 years. But what also happened was that in the last election, democracy took care of it. There are a myriad ways to access democracy in this country. We're a very mature and stable economy. But what was revealed in this period was dysfunction, very much centered in our mediating class. Now in 2010, it wasn't only the systems that I'm talking about, safeguarding the rule of law, equality legislation that had evolved since the last crisis of this time. These are the systems at the core of meeting 21st century economic challenges, systems which cross the care economy, family and the market economy, which reflect the rule of law, which reflect social change, where we should be using data in these systems. But unfortunately, what, began, what was also apparent in 2010 was the culture at the core of our mediating class, kind of the Labour Party, the LSE, the Guardian, the New Statesman, and their associated class, they had also, they generated quite considerable dysfunction because they had kind of come to gain power in a period where media was about broadcast only. So what happened in 2010 was this culture had to embrace a digital environment where all of a sudden they would be mixing with people who perhaps had previously dis delivered policy or who would be impacted by policy. And this was a very, very new change which exposed a lot of problems. Now, what was big, like what I wasn't aware of in 2010 was that part of Labour's identity is that their part of their business model is that they seek out social movements which might challenge their own political priorities. And because these are environments where it's often people who are powerless, this is a political media culture who institutionalized this is their standard model. They had planned. The budgets had been agreed pre-election and we all knew kind of which systems were getting it. Both Labour and the Tories had said, as was expected, it would be social care systems, local authority systems, which were already in crisis. And they would achieve savings by making welfare cuts. Now, this was very much a reflex response guided by this old economics with media at its core. But unfortunately, it was about lashing out at these systems that are core to us meeting our 21st century economic challenges. And what we found out in this period is why precisely these institutions cannot see these systems. Now, to put it bluntly, what was announced at this point was that this media culture had planned, the Labour and the Tories and their associated media cultures and think tanks, they had decided that the response to a financial crisis would be to lift approximately a third of the country out of democracy, 
to eliminate the rule of law that had developed since 1945 in the systems that are kind of coming to be in as part of the post-war settlement. Labour are very much a political culture who existed before democracy began. They played a central role in us becoming a democracy, but they had maintained this identity, this pre-democratic identity at the core of their institutions. And because this binary that we've had, this labour Tory binary has been so stable, there was a whole kind of culture of people in these institutions who believed you could just roll back democracy and return a 21st century society to a 19th century norm that they were familiar with. Now this is nonsense, it's utterly insane. But they believed that as long as they maintained an environment on Twitter where they could tell themselves that this was true and kind of prevent people accessing democracy and social movements while this policy re reflex happened, this would be absolutely fine. But in actual fact, this policy reflex was about undermining the rule of law. It was about literally starving people and exposing very vulnerable children and women to abuse. And women were at the center of it because Labour and the Tories' position was that you could just like, the synthetic modeling that we've used has a, a legacy breadwinner carer model at its center, even though heterogeneity of family forms is no longer contested. And they just believed that you could change society to match the picture in their head and their textbooks, which was outdated by this point, which had actually been at the core of the financial crisis by literally just, in, just literally setting up environments and manufacturing social movements. Now, one of the things that's defined the last 10 years is as this political and economic settlement has kind of ended, genuine social movements, spontaneous social movements, have then been mirrored by political media cultures online and we've ended up with Corbynism and Trumpism and we're not the only country where this has happened. And it's because of this intersection where this political media culture believed that they could do this. Now, I was invited to three, there were three separate things that I, I kind of ended up accidentally caught in the center of this. I had been the site of political responsibility for these systems as a social worker under a labor government. I had assumed I had trade unions. I had been treating the Guardian as the voice of these systems because I used the society page to apply for jobs. And I really, none of us was really clear. Leveson hadn't happened and we weren't clear on how dysfunctional our political media cultures were. So in the space of a few months, I was commissioned by Gabby Hinsliff, who had been the editor of The Observer, to write for a, a, a website they called Labour List, which I assumed was a subpar Labour fan site, but it turns out to be central to Labour culture. Um, I was asked to speak at Wadham College in Oxford by the young people who we came to, who came to be associated with the fake anti-cuts movement. The next generation of this media class, I just thought they were students. So that's like Laurie Penny, James Butler at Navarra, a lad called Adam Ramsby, who ended up kind of mapping out the same route in the Green Party. And this brought me into connection with a group of young people who called themselves the left. And these young people were from elite universities, Oxford, UCL, the LSE. And they had basically been, as I found out at the LSE, this is very deep rooted stuff. They didn't know that democracy existed. They had assumed that this was their opportunity to gain political careers. Now, one of the benefits of the individualism at the core of this media economics blueprint is that these young people made this about them in order to subordinate social movements to gain media careers, to gain kind of favor in the labor kind of hierarchy. They actually made it about them. So like, I've been quite frightened to do this video because actually being caught at this intersection has cost me quite dearly and caused very, very serious problems for me because they had never mixed with people who understood or delivered policy and were not aware of how society had changed in the last 30 years because this is an elite next generation of media class. So this generation of media class have the dubious honor of being the first neoliberal media class to actually seek out vulnerable people and not just seek to have policy delivered normally, but to seek out people. And as we saw in the last 10 years, to engender political kind of violence into our system through these Twitter-based social movements. So I was asked to speak at Wadham College. I've put underneath what I said. So all these people were aware that this was the rule of law around equality, around abuse, around harm, and that these systems were linked. And I was also invited to speak at an event called Netroots, which was held at the TUC House, so Trade Union Congress House in London. 
Now, this was an official event. Ed Miliband had decided, the leader of the Labour Party at this point, that the way that Labour would deliver, that would make sure that austerity was delivered, was that they would manufacture social movements, subordinate people in those social movements, gain the political capital as being seen by, as opposing austerity, while maintaining this policy reflex. And this is institutionalised in the Labour Party. They still don't know that this is a problem. They don't see this as a political media culture seeking out people to prevent them accessing democracy because they see it in terms of their own identity. And fundamentally, this is a class who kind of believe that democracy was temporary, that they are above democracy, that voters do not have sovereignty in a democracy. They do as a media class. This is sclerosis that developed over a very, very long period of time, but however it developed, and I'll put the video underneath about why the Labour Party can't be elected again, this is the situation that existed in 2010. So at Netroots, you saw people like Polly Toynbee speaking, Stella Creasy, who was a Labour MP, um, a columnist called Joanne Hari, who, who I think he got done for plagiarism or something, I don't know. Um, but they were also inviting vulnerable people to speak. So they invited me to speak about policy because they believed that the world was them and a, like a fictional working class. I think I was told by somebody at this event that I was the proletariat and I was like, no, this is the bottom line of political responsibility. But crucially, this was the Guardian newspaper, the trade unions and the Labour Party constructing a fake social movement of the type that's become a concern with Vladimir Putin and has created real weakness in our democracy. These mirror movements to actual political kind of instability. Now at the core of the Labour identity is direct democracy because they were part, they were instrumental in us becoming a democracy. But that's about them as a political party needing to be aware of the context that's changed around them. And what became apparent as they set up this social movement was that this was about subordinating people and harming people. And the pattern is generally that they would create an environment where they could have their behavior remain unspoken, subordinate and abuse these people so that they could not speak, and then use extensive media power, including trade unions. And because they had all the boxes checked, that's people's trade union power, that's the newspaper, that's a political party, they thought that that was all there was. But we're a very complex country with a myriad ways to access democracy and a very mature rule of law. And instead, this has just generated instability. Now, when I spoke at Netroots, because I was speaking about these systems as subject to political consensus, which they always have been for about 30 years, marginalized systems around marginalization, this is just the fact. They immediately, I had the organizer who was a guy called Sonny Hundal, who authored a blog called Liberal Conspiracy, come and interrupt my session and try and derail it. But then immediately a smear was placed about me in the, a, a publication called The New Left Project by a guy called David Wearing and a Labour councillor called Jessica Asato to say that I didn't understand democracy for discussing these systems that I only understood because I had been trained to do so under a Labour government. Jessica Asato later was trying to lock people out of a council meeting to agree these budget cuts because Labour's approach to this was just going to be, we'll stop people accessing democracy, it'll be easy as pie, we'll roll back to an 18th century society, that'll be fine, and people will come to us for democratic representation on Twitter. This is insane, but it actually got more insane as the dysfunction in their institution rolled out. So I had spoken at Wadham College, which was kind of a, a very elite university, Oxford University. I had been invited to speak at Netroots, and I had been commissioned by a woman called Gabby Hinsliff and then another woman to kind of write for The Guardian because they wanted to dress this up. They wanted the people who were impacted by this to discuss poverty. So they would be absolutely delighted when people died because they would see them as like stones to pelt. The Guardian would commission very vulnerable people who would be impacted by welfare policy and then wouldn't pay them unless they were abused by the comments underneath. These were 85 quid articles and they would recruit people and they didn't understand that this is like standard textbook grooming. This is the way organised crime works because they thought this was normal and they still do. I assume they're still demonstrating this on Twitter. 
Now, there were several stages. If you read, there's a guy called Aaron Bastani, and he's really interesting. So he had worked on David Miliband's kind of campaign, which was not successful. And in this period, he was saying that basically, we needed a continuation of excellent work at workfare policies to improve a can-do, we needed to use welfare policy to create a can-do attitude in the poor. And he, he immediately, during austerity, decided to rebrand himself as a political revolutionary. His PhD is actually really interesting because it details the connection of network of organizations around these people. He's very careful in his PhD not to say that he's an event organizer. And what's really worrying is his academic supervisor, apparently didn't mind this at all. So while organizing and having different aspects to an identity, there was um, a thing called Black Block, which is where elite young people are allowed to openly discuss violence as a tactic. In the UK, we do not do this. There was UK Uncut, which was about tax avoidance. Tax avoidance was a way that Labour were going to triangulate on kind of a, trying to roll back the rule of law on this, if they said they were against tax avoidance. So this was very much elite kind of networking elite activism linked into a desire to be part of an existing political media culture who had not considered the new kind of dimensions to their online environment and had decided that social movements would be a way to maintain their kind of bubble and to prevent people accessing democracy. Now, over the course of the 10 years, like basically what Labour kept seeking to do was to mirror existing instability. The actual protests against austerity, they were like half a, like they were some of the biggest protests the country had ever seen. But what we got to see was how Labour had prevented opposition to the Iraq war. So it didn't matter how many people marched, the media narratives would filter it into Labour versus the Tories to pretend that Labour were opposing these policies when they were not. And hundreds of thousands of people would march and then that would be channeled by the Labour Party and by our trade unions and by The Guardian into this narrative of Labour and the Tories. Therefore, the consensus around these policies is undiscussed and the economics for them was contained at the LSE, which is a left-wing university. But this would be untouched because they believe that they would have the power to do this. Now, in terms of like each of the publications for Labour had to come up with a different way of doing this. So the New Statesman, they commissioned me to write and then they literally, um, Helen Lewis um, literally sought out a troll who she knew was working with a violent man because he was working with a violent man. And this is the way that they were dealing with their female writers. They were recruiting people for vulnerability and then literally rounding on them with institutional narcissistic rage, which has continued to define this culture online for the last 10 years. But the Stella Creasy who had spoke at the Netroots event, she simultaneously wanted to get the political capital from opposing austerity. But she was also the person who was saying, this is Labour's austerity priorities. We are going to remove the rule of law that protects women and allows them to leave abuse. We are going, you know, this was attacking safeguarding social care. And she thought that the way to do this, to triangulate on this, she ended up campaigning on payday loans. So therefore, Stella Creasy, if you mentioned within any environment that she was in, that actually this was Labour policy too, you would get narcissistic rage. They eventually manufactured a situation where they had a campaign about a Jane Austen tenor. Merv King had insisted that there be a woman on a banknote because he'd objected to the fact that Elizabeth Fry was on the fiver and this was the only woman apart from the Queen. This was a predetermined, this had been in production for about two years I think. They manufactured a fake campaign about this kind of Jane Austen tenor, about the need for women to have representation. So that the feminist kind of environment that they were in control of would then kind of focus on that. So that actually the undermining of the rule of law and all women's rights for the last 70 years would not be discussed. Now what's crucial to understand with this culture around Labour is this was entirely generated by narcissism. One of the things that's made our political system so vulnerable. Labour had always tried, they had a, a system called triangulation, which is, you know, there would be two kind of opposing positions that they had to tally in a media narrative. In a media narrative, you can do it just by kind of getting halfway between the two and triangulating between the two and projecting it out, and there won't be that much response. 
but on a, when you've got a social dimension added to political communication, what we realized was this culture was driven by narcissism because it's about projection of their own identity. It's like a rowing boat going around in circles. But unfortunately, these people made themselves the face of this period where this instability was generated. It became apparent um, within the trade unions. Um, Owen Jones became the face of subordinating welfare claimants so that Labour could capitalise on these social movements. He would use massive amounts of narcissistic abuse online. They would be in denial that they were a political media culture. I think he actually came from PCS and like he and at Oxford University and illustrated the elite social capture of the trade unions who should have been representing these people. Unite as a union introduced a scheme where they would take money from welfare claimants under the kind of impression that these people would get representation. A young woman called Ellie Mayer Hagen, these people thought they were getting like a proper trade union. Ellie Mayer Hagen, who was a young woman desperate for a media career and willing to subordinate welfare claimants to do it, was then trying to farm out their confidential work to other activist organizations for credit because this, the principles of confidentiality, the principles of actually these systems, the 20th century systems re evolved very much as a reaction against what these people demonstrated. Pre-war welfare systems had been very much about a liberal class doing good for the poor and causing a great deal of harm, the workhouses, this kind of thing. This was before democracy. The welfare state had come into being in 1945 as a response to this identity and this rule of law. All the practitioners, not just social workers, but you know, doctors, nurses, they reflect on the power that they have. They reflect on the institutions they're part of. They reflect on kind of the dynamics between them and people who are much more vulnerable than them. And they actually take care of that to make sure there are no abuses of power because we are a democracy. Labour had been using social movements to subordinate people in environments where they believed that because these people were powerless, their behaviour would go unspoken. But the nature of Twitter was that they've created a 10-year written record, including their own media narratives and their own tweets of them doing this. Now, luckily, British democracy has taken care of this. But this 10-year record of how a mediating class generate instability at the end of a political and economic settlement is very, very, very important. Now, one of the problems with the way that Labour subordinate social movement and generate elite capture of social movements is that they don't know they're doing it. When Helen Lewis and the New Statesman had asked me for material and then punished me for it, by literally trying to generate the risk of violence for me and my daughter. I had identified that this was a narcissistic culture and the power dynamics between me and a political media culture was such that I should be nowhere near them. I refused to write for The Guardian, I refused to write for The New Statesman and I never went near them after that. But I continue to record the process by which these systems consolidate. But unfortunately, that also meant recording the centre-left generating instability because actually, at its very simplest, they were a protective barrier. They were the reason that our economics hasn't been able to adapt to the context changing around it. They just thought this was as simple as their class identity. With narcissism, accusations are often admissions. You'll find The Guardian discuss things like globalization has left the working class behind. What they mean is they cannot function in an environment where democracy exists and where they hear the impact of their own behaviour and they no longer have the power to impose that. We're not in an 18th century liberal society where they can demand that the opium wars are accelerated to make themselves feel better. You know, even the world that allowed kind of the Iraq war, that is gone. But what they have demonstrated in the last 10 years is what they did and many of the people that were kind of came to prominence in this period, a part of a very fossilised culture within the Labour Party. Not only at the root of handing Margaret Thatcher her 1983 election victory, but also with the Stop the War movement, they showed with austerity how they had driven the very widespread public opposition to those wars, two million people marching into this tiny fossilised left-wing culture at the core of our trade unions, political party and the Guardian and the New Statesman.
And now they're kind of in a position where democracy has taken care of them. They won't be elected again. They ended up turning on Jewish people. And they're simultaneously sharing, well, how can we reach the working class after spending 10 years doing this? Now, one of the things that the publications, The Guardian, The New Statesman did was to triangulate on their desire to roll back every right that women had won in the last 70 years and their belief it could be done. They commissioned very abusive males to present the face of trans rights activism. So largely, like, trans rights, like, transgenderism and the ability to kind of live as a, as a sex opposite to yours is a very new development. This is a very, actually mostly a very vulnerable group of people. But what the Guardian and the New Statesman did was, and particularly the Green Party, they latched onto this, commissioned incredibly abusive males. John Nozimayo, who was, you know, discussing how rape was now something women had to accept because of his identity and calling it legal scholarship. Amy Chaloner and the Green Party targeting 50,000 women. And this generated a situation where British women were unsafe to speak. I had never been near the Labour Party and I had a political party put me on a list to be monitored for transphobia. I had actually warned about the backlash against trans rights when they press themselves against kind of safeguarding systems. I had said that this would generate a backlash and that the nature of this rule of law is that all women would have to do is stand up and see these systems exist. But I had been made a national target because Labour basically was still responding with narcissistic rage because in 2010 and 11 I had said, OK, I'll record your triangulation strategy on this, but it won't be possible. Now, the situation with trans rights activism, what was really interesting is that for a period in time, exactly as I said would happen, happened. Women all over the country stood up and said, actually, we're not asking for rights. These are already ours. You can't press yourself against safeguarding. There's nobody now who would consider that an adult activist identity should be taking priority over safeguarding children. That's done. But what was really interesting was that this movement where women all stood up together, the very same women who had then commissioned trans rights activists kind of were standing up and the very same mechanism of elite social capture happened in that movement. Um, I was invited to the House of Lords to see the one of the final debates, which was really, really interesting. Unfortunately, the woman organising it, Karen Angala Smith, within a week of the Gender Recognition Act review, Labour had subordinated this discussion to their own needs. I've put the article underneath, which actually is Karen demonstrating the exact reflex. She presents UKIP as a threat. She presents kind of um, the subordination of these systems to the labor identity as a done deal. But in private, what she had also done was elevated the same troll that Helen Lewis had used several years earlier to generate the risk of violence for me and my family. And because kind of this was a social movement, she did the thing that Labour do of creating an environment where their behaviour can go unspoken, where nobody can challenge it because they will lash out. And even though I wasn't online, I had attended my MP's office on the 15th of November and I had considered my work done. I had recorded entirely how this policy reflex had kind of been delivered. I had been to the LSE. I had placed the reflex that I'd observed within Labour cultures as driving crisis in my thesis in 2015. The social movement kind of where people stood up for safeguard it was, to my mind, the final stage. And instead what happened was even though I wasn't online, I was actually at home in the middle of a PTSD crisis, unable to use a phone or open a letter. I was quite seriously ill at the time. I was then summoned. It turned out that Karen had five years earlier not known that these systems existed and had said so in some tweets. And so she had used the movement against this to do precisely what that movement was about. I find myself dragged to the Met. I found a BBC producer demanding I not be published. I was absolutely, I don't think you're allowed to mention me in the movement about trans rights activism, but more importantly, she elevated a far right troll who she knew kind of was very dangerous. And they were allowed to behave with impunity for two years afterwards, quite openly because they had the cover of Twitter and this elite social capture. I understand that the, the elite social capture is complete. I don't go online, I don't go near activism. This is actually one of the reasons I've been quite frightened to make this video today.
because these people had created this environment in an online environment and then made it about them. I think Owen Jones used to trigger narcissistic abuse to any woman or welfare claimant or kind of somebody campaigning about welfare or discussing Labour's position with why are they all obsessed with me and then unleash his followers onto them. There is no way to describe how this culture kind of have used social movements without naming them. One of the interesting things about Aaron Bastani's PhD is he outlines very clearly the social network of activists around this media class, UK on Cut, Black Bloc, the, the publications Open Democracy, The Guardian, The New Statesman, that they were able to use as a young generation of elite media class. But he very he, he's trying to present it in his PhD research that he was observing this. Like he's eliminated his own identity so he can illu illustrate these networks. But in actual fact, it was just him discussing organizing protests with his mates. Now, the problem is that this use of social movements, which is a very deep concern, has actually been about Labour maintaining ignorance of the systems that they were politically responsible for. So they have simultaneously said that they were not aware of these systems' existence. They have simultaneously said that their identity was that the financial crisis meant we would return to a pre-1945 norm where democracy didn't exist that wasn't possible. They've unleashed abuse and violence kind of through social movements onto vulnerable people. But this then led to a war within the Labour Party and the, the norms that had become kind of normalised on vulnerable people in social movements, they then turned inwards on the Labour Party itself. Now what I'm going to discuss in the next video is the phenomena of Corbynism. Um, whereby this small culture and the kind of fossilized labor left culture that they were tied into attempted to literally take, they took over the Labour Party and were literally by, I think it was about 2017, they were stating openly on television that they wanted to return to a democratic centralist model, which is literally the model of governance that North Korea have. And then on in the last election, we saw the unprecedented kind of thing of a political party turn its, turning its supporter base on Jewish people. So all in all, you have these cultures of institutions, trade unions, Labour Party, Guardian and New Statesmen, who in order to maintain ignorance and to protect an economics where the context had changed around it, have exposed all the dysfunction in their organisations, are behaving by narcissistic reflex, continuing to do so even though they are not electable. I think The Guardian has a circulation of about 100,000. They're still using social movements in this way. The very movement that actually resulted from trans rights activists being encouraged to push themselves against safeguarding by this culture. Actually, they demonstrated the same elite social capture of that movement because it's done by reflex. It's a narcissistic reflex. And this is not only led to the situation that resulted in Corbynism and Jewish people being turned on, but it's actually led to a very real security risk because men like Vladimir Putin are able to use the predictability of this one-note reflex to undermine kind of other countries' democratic processes. At present, I think, like I haven't been online for about two years, I was absolutely terrified about making this video and I actually... Like there's actually, I'm going to put the playlist on Denise about some of the abuse I suffered and it only goes up to a couple of weeks after the trans rights video. It doesn't include the last two years. I was left majorly quite frightened to do this video, but there is no way because of the individualism that they've used where they've made it about their personalities. There's no way to describe how this political culture have functioned to generate these fake social movements without doing that. It makes them very dangerous. But what we've seen across the Western world, particularly around, you know, Occupy was an, I'm going to do a video about Occupy the week after next and what that symbolized. Um, the emergence of street politics in that way on a global scale was an indicator that this political economic settlement was coming to an end. The protests against austerity were enormous. And what we've also seen is the mirroring of protest movements by these narcissistic online cultures which have resulted in Trumpism and Corbynism. So next week I'm going to be back, I'm going to discuss Corbynism in a lot of detail, I'm going to discuss what that model of activism is, where in the world we've also seen it, you can see it in Iran, you can see it in China, you can see it with the Russian Revolution, um, where these elite cultures on the edge of power just wait for an opportunity.
and I'm going to discuss Jeremy Corbyn and his actions in Korea and the way that they have contributed to the current situation that the country is in. Now, I am still talking to people. I don't talk to people on Twitter. I don't use Facebook. I don't use Instagram, but I do talk to people on Patreon. I'll put my Patreon underneath. All donations welcome. And I'll also put my PayPal. I'm still crowdfunding for mainly books at the minute, books and research materials for the series that I'm looking at about the history of the Silk Roads. I will be back in a few days with an overdue video looking at, it's part two of my video looking at Persia and Greece and I'll be looking at the Parthian Empire in particularly and the events around the first century. Thank you for sticking with me today.